So, Professor uh, Sherry Lowen, would you say that in Judaism, Eve, as in Adam and Eve, is good or bad? Uh, I would say it's a little complicated. The answer is a little bit complicated. On the one hand, a lot of the rabbinic sources, when they talk about the first sin, this first sin, they almost always talk about Adam sinning. So he's the character that's that appears in the texts, right? The rabbis are talking about Adam sinning. Adam was created. Adam this, God when he created Adam, and not so much Eve. On the other hand, there are rabbinic sources that talk about specific characteristics that are inherent to the female body that are sort of punishment for Eve's behavior um, or a consequence for Eve's behavior. Mm -hmm. And those are, uh, some of them are things that make women impure, mm -hmm. um, but sort of biologically impure, like menstruation or childbirth. And mm -hmm. so something that knocks women into a category that's that's bad, I guess you should say. I mean, mm -hmm. purity and badness are not the same, but it's not good to be impure. Um, and so women suffering as a consequence of that um, would indicate that Eve is less good, maybe. Um, and there are there are other sources also that talk about, you know, why was Eve created from a rib as opposed to anywhere else on Adam's body? Mm -hmm. And um, the idea that the, a rib is crooked is sort of seen as a uh, sort of influences who she becomes as a person, that she's mm -hmm. sort of a, this crooked thing in the rabbinic sources. But I, I don't think it, it would not be accurate to say that Eve is is bad, uh, specific, like in, in the original sin terms of bad. Yes. Um, I think the bit about the crooked rib makes it good. into the hadith in Islamic. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does. So, and signals not only Eve's uh, the crooked character maybe it sounds yeah harsh but but something more general about women yeah something about women that's not great and that that goes back to her to mm -hmm. eve the first mother mm -hmm. but she's not um like this seductress that we sort of think about in modern maybe in medieval art where she like sort of seduces adam with her wiles there are texts that actually talk about it you know how did she get him to eat i mean the biblical text is very clear that she get she takes a bite and she just gives it he's like standing there and so he's he shouldn't be free of blame he seems to be present for the entire conversation and doesn't pipe up um but there are rabbinic texts that try to figure out what what was it this thing that she gave him and and how did she get him to eat so you know, on the one hand, she's kind of a neutral character, like, other than the fact that she's complicit in this first violation of God's command. Um, and she is not a neutral character. Um, yeah. I want to circle back to the what was it a bit uh, and how medieval uh, commentators understood what really went down between Adam and Eve and the serpent. Uh, but first, everyone, welcome to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I'm really delighted to be with a good friend and a great, great scholar, uh, Professor Sherry Lowen. She's professor in the Religious Studies and Theology Department of Stonehill College, which um, I just learned is in Easton. Is that right? Easton, Massachusetts. Yep. And uh, she's the author of many, many works. She's been working recently on the various statements attributed to the Jews in the Quran. I'm hoping that will be another episode. Uh, of this podcast. Um, she's published, you know, among her many works, The Making of a Forefather, Abraham in Islamic and Jewish Exegetical Narratives, as well as Arabic and Hebrew love poems of El Andalus. Um, so, uh, and it's, she's been with us before. So we had a great uh, conversation, very popular episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible, which by the way, you should uh, subscribe to. You should also like this video, please. Thank you. Um, but in our earlier episode, uh, which you should watch, we spoke about sort of, you know, prophets um, behaving badly or characters known to the Islamic tradition as prophets behaving badly in the Bible and how that complicates a conversation about these characters. Uh, but today we're speaking about Adam and Eve, um, and we're starting with Eve. And then, uh, Sherry, you mentioned that in medieval Jewish sources, um, even though it seems like the account of the first book of the Bible Genesis uh, in chapters two and three, I guess, especially three, 
it seems like it's kind of straightforward. You know, the serpent speaks to Eve and, um, you know, Eve eats from the forbidden tree and then just gives to Adam and then he eats. But they kind of read more into that. Yeah, there's there's an attempt to figure out what how. Because the the rabbinic understanding of human nature or the classical rabbinic understanding of human nature is that people are created with free will and not so not sort of like the 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 christian more idea where they were created sort of innocent and pure which would and and in sinning they introduced sin into the world mm -hmm. that doesn't really exist in the rabbinic in the rabbinic mindset that they're constantly they were always capable of sinning mm -hmm. but how did they they had one measly commandment and and how was it that the very first couple who had this intimate relationship with god um, more than the rest of us, even more closer. To, how did they violate God's command? How did that happen? And so, um, and when did it happen? How long were they on earth before it happened? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of wrestling with it in the rabbinic sources. And what does it mean for us for that for that that they sin? Does it actually mean something bad? And you can see in the in the early rabbinic sources, um, people always say that Judaism doesn't have a concept of original sin, mm -hmm. which it doesn't. Have a concept of original sin but you can see in some of the sources that there's something there that seems to maybe lead to the concept of original in other words the connection between what's going on in the classical sources and the development of that concept in christianity is not crazy it's it's there is a connective tissue mm -hmm. but that that what went down in the garden uh had consequences for yeah uh, for everyone including us today and yeah, I mean, not the same consequences that we find in Christianity. Yeah, it didn't yeah. Uh, necessitate, maybe that's the wrong verb because it's a theological problem, but it didn't yeah. lead to some necessary, there is again, atonement or redemption right. or some divine intervention in a way that Christians understand the life of Jesus. Yeah. And, yeah. Right. There is actually, what's really fascinating is, um, I was I had the source ready to look at it, but now I'm like a little... I'll find it in a second. There, there is a, there are two classical sources in the rabbinic, um, in the rabbinic system that talk about why are, you know, it seems that something happened that hit everyone, yep. and the revelation of of the Torah on Sinai. They don't use this word, but cleansed the Jews. Okay. So that which parallels, right? If Jesus is the Word of God made flesh and the torah yes. is the word of god yes and both of them sort of like cleanse you of whatever it was that happened yes in the garden i mean there's like a parallel situation there um and so this idea that the torah gets rid of whatever it was that happened in eden but whatever it was that happened in eden is still not the same exact thing that as we, that we find that, that yeah, we as find christians that might see it yeah. um and there's nothing so that anybody has to do now Right, it's not. It, it was a cleansing that happened, and then it's done. It's done. Everybody's fine, or at least the Jews are fine. So, I mean, just to remind uh, those who may not know the account, hopefully, I'll describe it uh, uh, relatively accurately. That um, so, you know, we hopefully folks would kind of generally have a sense of the biblical story uh, that you know the Israelites um, end up in Egypt, and then. You know, they go through the sea and Moses and then they're at Mount Sinai. And um, I mean, my sense is that generally Christians and Muslims uh, don't appreciate uh, how um, central the idea of uh, the covenant or maybe it's better to speak of the revelation of the Torah is to Moses on Mount Sinai um, and the covenant or contract that subsequently takes place between God and all of Israel at Mount Sinai. Um, I mean, could you sort of explain that for you know uh muslims and christians like you know why is that such a big deal obviously it's in the christian bible as well also in the quran you know you have you know references to the Taurat in arabic the Torah. so there's something similar there most received revelation but it's kind of next level i think in in judaism so yeah what should what should muslims and christians know i mean i think that what you just said is is what's the key important is that that moment is the moment of first of all theophany but also it's it's a moment of of a binding contract between the nation of Israel and their God. 
and it's a contract that is not undoable. So um, uh, there's this uh, Christian idea, this early Christian idea that comes and says basically the Jews sinned so much and the and the contract like God, this replacement theology, right, where God replaces the, right, the supersessionism, which is Christianity. And Islam does have it also as well, a certain element of supersessionism that Islam is the the preferable religion of the three and and uh, this idea that there was islam recognizes the quran recognizes there was a covenant or a contract between god and um israel but they violated the the rabbis classical judaism recognizes that the israelites and the jews are constantly violating the contract mm -hmm. but the way i describe it to my students is that the contract between god and the israelites in Judaism is similar to a Catholic marriage, which is that you can't get out of it. There's no such thing as divorce. So you can do terrible things in your marriage that violate the covenant of marriage, but you can't get out of it. And that's sort of a negative way of saying it. But the, the point really is that God makes this covenant with Israel because he loves them. It's a covenant of love. Um, and because God is infinite, his love is infinite, and his promise is infinite. And he doesn't change his mind when it comes to that covenant. So even though the Israelites and the and later their, you know, the Jews can can mess up, um, it's still binding on everyone. And it's it's never violatable. And that traces back not just to the covenant Sinai, it traces back to Abraham as well, who starts the covenant. And then there's this sort of nation. I don't know what you had to call it really like this covenant with the nation of Israel mm -hmm. that happens at Sinai, mm -hmm. which is right after the freedom from slavery mm -hmm. um, and and on purpose, right? That that the Jews understand it, that sort of the Jews are are freed from slavery to humans, mm -hmm. the slavery to become slaves of God, um, which is a better a better type of slavery. I mean, I don't think that maybe the, the word is better translatable as servants of God. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an amazing relationship. Mm -hmm. So those two things are intimately connected. And, it, and those two moments in biblical history are defining for the, the entire way Judaism understands itself. And Jews the, are supposed the, the to- The liberation and the covenant. Yeah, everything. Like every holiday goes back to, if not for God redeeming us from slavery, we would have still been slaves in Egypt. And the fact that we're free now is because of that moment. And then God gave us the Torah, which is the covenant with God. And like, it's just, it's an incessant repetition of those two things over and over and over. So it's a really central point. And I think Christians and, and Muslims or Christianity and Islam recognizes it, but I don't know that they, it's fully grasped how much it's over and over and over. Yeah, for, I mean, try to summarize it and someone can, you know, push back in the comments maybe. But I think for the Christian view, we're supposed to be talking about Adam and Eve, we'll circle back to that in a second. But the, I think the Christian view of um, the Exodus, liberation from slavery, plus the covenant on Mount Sinai is basically kind of just blurred, fuzzy, like, you know, everything ultimately is part of the salvation history that leads to Jesus, right. or Christians would say to, to Christ. Uh, for Muslims, you know, all prophets, you know, basically are similar. You know, they receive divine revelation. Um, they remind people of their sort of uh, natural obligation to worship God alone. Um, so it's not really punctuated by this, like, yeah, intense uh, sort of, or these two intense events, um, which mark uh, Israel's experience. Um, it's okay if we circle back to Adam and Eve now? Sure, yeah. Um, I thought we'd we'd start. I mean, I had planned things a little differently, but I think it might be helpful for us to get into the Genesis narrative a little bit. I mean, uh, many Muslims will not be familiar with it, uh, you know, um, reason or another. Uh, that's another topic. Um, even many Christians will not be familiar of it, and it could be something that they just kind of think of. Uh, I mean, in light of stuff they hear from someone, maybe in church, maybe somewhere else, maybe on TikTok. So, I mean, um, the, the narrative, um, if we start with Genesis chapter two, so the second chapter of the Bible, uh, it starts with this, <clears throat> at least the bit I'd like to discuss, starts with this intriguing um, line. So I'm uh, uh, gonna, going to read here from Genesis chapter two, beginning verse 18. This is the revised standard, so the revised standard <laughs> translation, excuse me for my cough. 
uh, which you know you you can correct um, if you see something that may not uh, explain the Hebrew very well. But uh, so Genesis two eighteen. Um, then the Lord God said, "It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him." So maybe if we just start with that, I mean, what's going on there? Like, what? Yeah. Maybe how do the rabbis understand that? Like. Why is it not good that man should be alone? Why does he need a helper? How did what did they understand from that? So first, first I, I wanted to I know in some of your your one of your questions was about this word the man, which gets yeah. I think yeah. is translated uh, mostly in the English translations we find the man, but that's not what the text actually says in Hebrew, okay. and the which, which this is why his name is Adam, um because the Hebrew is he doesn't have a name actually what's what I find fascinating about this is she has a name he actually doesn't have a name and what he is and i think in the translation sometimes you'll see adam as if as if he did have a first name but he doesn't the word is ha adam which in hebrew means the human or even the word why is he called adam because he comes from adama right so it's really which is earth so he's really the i guess the most accurate translation would be um, and God saw that it wasn't good for the earth creature to be okay. alone. To because be alone. he is, I mean, a little earlier in chapter two, he's actually created from the dirt. From the earth. Yeah, he's created from the earth. So he's called the earth creature. And then it says, I will make him, and then fitting counterpart, is that the translation that you had? Um, helper. Yeah. So the Hebrew is Azar Kenegdo, which is such a difficult phrase and one that I don't know that I've ever seen anything particularly satisfying to me. In Azar Kenegdo, in Azar, Azar is a helper, but Kenegdo means either in front of you or somebody, it's like a mama sort of in Arabic, like someone who's in front of you, but also um, facing you. And and it, it also has the sense of against you. Hmm. So um, like not a yes man. <laughs> Right. Is this other yeah, or woman is the sort of this implied idea that it's a it's um it's not good for a person to be alone, but it's also what's not good is or what is better is for the person to have someone who challenges them a little bit is is why right. So that's a that's one interpretation. You had this helper, I don't know, did you have against him or a fitting helper? Um a, a helper fit for him. Yeah. So the translation that I'm looking at, which is the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, has fitting counterpart. And I think that the word counterpart also has that counter in there as well, right? This idea of oh, counter. Could be down, downplaying the first Hebrew word, which I'll mispronounce, but which has something to do with help, right? The first one. Yeah, Azer, which has to do with, with helping and more connecto. So what's going on there? Why does he need one? Yeah. It's just I, I don't know. But, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But we do see that the very next thing that happens is that God makes animals. Mm -hmm. So it's bad. I mean, I think that after all of us, after COVID and Zooming and not being isolation, I think are intimately aware of how bad it is to be alone and to be to have nothing and nobody. And that what I think is interesting here is that having God is not enough to say mm -hmm. that maybe blasphemously, but it's, it's not enough right. uh, to have God is God going to bring you soup when you're feeling sick and and you know things along those lines like it's not good for people to be alone without people mm -hmm. and and uh that's because I in, think the, what, in the chapter two narrative the animals like they're not they're not the answer it, it doesn't no it, in this narrative they're not the answer right he brings all the animals and all the birds and he brings it to go, to Adam to this earth creature to see as it says here my crelo what will he call it what will he name it which is also an interesting thing. What do, what do you mean? What will you name it? And um, which in the Quran, uh, I mean, sorry, I don't want to uh, interrupt you too much, which I'm already doing. But in the Quran, of course, it's God who uh, gives the names to Adam. But right. Genesis, Adam himself gives. Right. Them. And I think the significant difference, right, that God and in the Quran, it's also perceived as like a way to show the angels that that Adam is the preferred creature because God gives him the secret information mm -hmm. that he doesn't give to the angels. But mm -hmm. here it's not, there's no secret information that's coming from God. It's that God brings him these animals and says, let's see what you call them. And what does that mean? Let's see what you call them. And I think there's some sort of implied, like 
will he recognize them as being something that belongs with him or will he not recognize them? Um, and, and it says that he just calls them, he calls them by their names or he gives them names, these animals and these birds. And then in verse 21, it says there, but no, but he did, he did not find a fitting counterpart for, for this earth creature. And in the way the Hebrew is, who is the pronoun? He did not. Is it God did not or Adam did not? Because it doesn't say Adam did not find. It says, and to Adam, ule Adam. So for the earth creature, he did not find. Yeah. So who's, yeah. there's like a little ambiguity in the text there. Now, if I can just ask about this contrast between Quran and Bible on um, Adam naming all of the things, uh, even eventually the woman, I think uh, he gives, yeah. gives her the name uh, woman. Um, and then, uh, whereas in the Quran, it's God tells Adam what the names of all things are. And I mean, just as you said, I think the point in the Quranic context in chapter two of the Quran is that, um, you know, Adam sort of demonstrates his superiority to the angels. Uh, but in a polemical context, people are kind of like, oh, look, you know, the Bible gives more agency to humans. Yes. Um, God sort of is empowering uh, Adam. You know, you have autonomy, whereas the Quran, it's just like God tells you everything and you just kind of obey and follow along. Uh, what do you think of that argument? Um, I, th I think that there is a sense in the in the biblical story that there is a lot more agency for people. But I don't think the Quranic story is meant to take away the agency from okay. people. I think there's okay. I think there's some other, like you said, this polemic going on there with this relationship between Adam and God. I, I mean. I know I'm jumping ahead, but I think what's fascinating about the Quranic story is that Adam does penance in the Quranic story, and he does not in the biblical story. Mm -hmm. There's no penance there. Mm -hmm. So um, that tells us something about Adam in the Quran, that he does have a lot of agency. He he recognizes his his misstep, his yeah. wrongdoing, yeah. and and he, he apologizes and 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 asks for forgiveness, which yeah. we don't. We don't find that in the Bible. So if you want to make a polemical statement, you could definitely point to that. Yeah. But I mean, what would you say um, to the idea that, I mean, the Quran's just like a completely different kind of thing. Um, you know, even this account, which seems similar to Gen. So this account, meaning, you know, the stories about Adam uh, in the garden, um, in the Quran, you know, they look like Genesis two and three, but you know, the, the Quran is basically really religious, you know, it just wants to kind of drill into its audience that God is Lord, that humans should obey him. If they mess up, they should repent. And that's, it sort of carries that out through the Adam story, but the Genesis two and three account is really not religious. I mean, maybe it's the wrong word, really not religious or spiritual at all. It's just like a story, uh, is that going? I don't, to I don't think it's not religious at all. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think at all that that's what's going on. I think that there's a lot of um, a lot of messaging about about human nature, and and a lot of things that are stupendously ambiguous. I think on, on purpose that mm -hmm. things are ambiguous, and that I think this is a story in which the Bible does what it does best, which is that it purposely is ambiguous to invite you in to wrestle with the with the stuff. So I, I think that wrestling is inherently religious and, and inherently about what's the relationship. The readers or the yeah. interpreters. Yeah. It, it's it's pulling you in exactly the way you started off the conversation. What do we make of this? What what are we supposed to do about that? And and what is it what does it even mean to say who is this as our connecto? And what we haven't mentioned also, Gabriel, is the fact that this is not the only creation story in Genesis, mm -hmm. which is that the the other creation story is a is a completely different story. The first the first chapter of the Bible. Right. The yeah. first chapter of the Bible, which we don't have Eve created out of Adam's body, and we mm -hmm. don't have um this whole naming of the animals, and we don't have this whole counterpart help me whatever a situation going on mm -hmm. there. It's it's a different story. And how do you what is going on with that? Right? What are we supposed to understand from those two stories? And does that story affect how we're supposed to read this story? Which I would say, yes, that that story affects how you're supposed to understand this story. Um, and I think, you know, the rabbis also, they they also would say, like, well, given what it says in the first story, how can we mm -hmm. understand this second story? What's going on there? 
Mm -hmm. So are they two different stories? And if they're two different stories, what's the point of those two different stories? Yes. Um, sorry, I look like you have a question. Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, that's like a huge issue for, I mean, th because Genesis is the first uh, book of the Bible, this is where people start. And, you know, they read Genesis 1 and it's just, I mean, I guess up to, is it, does that story sort of go up to the first few verses, Genesis 2, whatever. Uh, but and then they read the next story in the garden and it's like, you know, so different. Um, yeah. I mean, part of the difference is what uh, people might call sort of like the mythical or the storytelling quality of the, the garden episode uh, Genesis two and three. I mean, and maybe the best uh, example of that is uh, a talking snake. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean. Uh, people, I think, are kind of, I don't, dulled to the shocking nature yeah. that you have an animal that's talking. <laughs> yeah, he's story. not the only animal that talks in the Bible, which is interesting, but... I guess so. A, yeah, there's, there's a, a donkey. donkey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a donkey. Yeah, yeah in donkey. the Quran, uh, ants ants talk. Yeah, I love those ants. They're very in cute. In the story of uh, Solomon, there's probably yeah. some others that I'm not thinking of right now, but definitely the ants talk. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so... I mean, what's going on here? Why is there a snake that's talking in the Quran? There's, it's not a snake, it's Satan, which maybe we can speak about the difference. But yeah, why do we have this talking snake? Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> why do we have a talking snake? And also, um, if you look at the description of the talking snake, um, it, he's he's called in Hebrew, Arum, that he is the, it's often translated as the most crafty mm -hmm. or shrewdest. Mm -hmm. And and he, if you look at his punishment, in the Bible, in the in the punishment is not what I find fascinating. Not that the snake won't talk anymore, because it's his talking that causes the problem, right? It's that the so snake. So that would be kind of an, a logical punishment. Would be yeah, a logical punishment problem. would be like God comes in and says snakes can't talk anymore because look what they mm -hmm. do. But instead, what God says is they're going to lose their hands and feet. So it looks like this original snake was like some sort of lizard with with feet, hands and feet, and which you find in Islamic traditions too, by the way, that bring in the snake anyway yeah yeah yeah, yeah. were longer than a camel or his legs were longer than a camel's i think some of the yeah so this you know he loses that and he also like has to eat dust like lick the dust which is i think clearly an image of sort of like the tongue darting in and out of a, but it, he doesn't lose his power of speech okay so then we have to ask why that doesn't make any like it you would think that it should um and what does it mean to be that he's the most crafty and and why is he involved? And this word arum, again, you know, when you read it in English, I, I find this a lot with the early stories of Genesis, that they're told as if they're children's stories, that we're so used to them, as you're saying, that, like, we get these little children's stories, and they're super complicated. Like, they're not children's stories. Um, you know, the whole Noah Noah's Ark, which is a children's story frequently, is also super complicated in the Bible. So. One of the things that happens is, what does it mean to say that this nachash, nachash which is the Hebrew word there, um, for the is snake. A, yeah, for snake, mm -hmm. is arum. And the word arum is also the same word in Hebrew. It's the same consonants for arum, which is naked. Mm -hmm. So, and we know that there's a nakedness thing that happens in the story, right? That they discover that they're naked, mm -hmm. not that they discover that they're crafty. Mm -hmm. So... It looks like the text is playing on these words, right? That that this snake, which is a room, leads to them understanding that they are a Rome, um, which I think is really an interesting parallel. But there's also a rabbinic text that says that the snake, this is kind of gross, but the snake um, was watching Adam and Eve in the garden who were naked and having sex with each other. And he developed a lust for, because the question the rabbis are asking is, what does the snake get out of this? Why does he insert himself into the story? Yes. What is this craftiness? And is yes. this craftiness related to nakedness? Why is this the word that's used to describe him? So the idea was that he fell in lust with Eve, mm -hmm. say the rabbis, and he thought if he could cause a, a wedge in this relationship, he could get Eve as well. Doesn't work. But that was his... <laughs> that's why he inserts himself yeah. into this story but i think it's also maybe i don't 
not coincidental that a snake is it's kind of a phallic image also right that this idea of this snake so this snake which is naked and in love or in lust with eve that's trying to that's watching them have sex and then wants to get involved wow uh, we yeah. are yeah this Great. Is, it's a crazy it's like back the boundaries of uh, <laughs> uh exploring the quran and the bible this is yes yeah that's why i feel like it's, it's a, a lot this, and, yeah <laughs> there's a lot going on in these in these stories and now, i mean is it okay if i jump in with a question about the quran just to uh, for a point of comparison because i mean in some ways the quran seems to solve this problem by um well first of all the snake's not there at all it's right. just you know uh, a shaitan so you know satan coming from the hebrew word for satan which we could i guess we go to maybe at some point but i mean the reason why satan in the quran Quranic episodes on the garden wants to cause trouble is because it, the man, I mean, it seems pretty clear. I don't think it's, ex no, it is said explicitly because there's this bit about uh, 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 anyway, the man has caused his downfall from heaven uh, when God commanded all the angels to bow down right. to the man. And obviously uh, the devil does not. And then he's cast out of the heaven or the highest heaven. So the whole thing is an act of revenge against you know the the causing causing adam to slip from there slip from the garden i guess uh with the arabic verb um you know it's an act of wrench so it's kind of like you know it solves a problem or maybe uh uh makes less ambiguous what is ambiguous with the snake in genesis yeah well yeah i think that it, it's a it gets a lot of that information from christianity with the quran yes um yes has yeah, it's there you know, in early christian texts yeah. right the whole replacement of the snake with with shaitan mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. um not in the rabbinic texts or not in the biblical text right satan doesn't come into the hebrew bible until like way 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 further yeah. on but rabbi, and, don't the rabbis there's another name there i'm not thinking of right now that's connected with the devil somehow and identified with a snake in later jewish texts no um Samuel or something. Like Samael, that. right? Samael, right? Samael is um, it's, it's, he's supposed to be an angel. Okay. But um, you know, it's because Judaism goes through some changes, right? The Jewish text, like there's a lot of different groups. Mm -hmm. There's there's no real concept of which we do find in this story in the Quran and also in Christian sources. There's no real concept that that. Satan was an angel who fell from heaven. That, sorry, let me back that up. I think that that story comes from Enoch, from the book of Enoch, which okay. is actually a Jewish source in okay. its very his core. Um, and so, so to say that Judaism doesn't have that concept is a little inaccurate because it's. I think it. I think it goes back, if I remember correctly, to three Enoch. Okay. But three Enoch is not accepted into the canonical. Um, Hebrew Bible or rabbinic texts, oh, right? It's not, even in kind yeah. of like the library of authority right. of resources yeah. for the rabbi. Right. Okay. Like okay. three Anak is a source that Jews don't know unless they're in academic Jewish studies, right? Got it's it. not yeah. it's not a source that's studied and it doesn't in affect the it. You're not reading three Anak. Okay. They don't even know about it. Okay. Right. Like it's not, it's, um, but I mean, to me, this is a really nice example, like the sort of clarity of the Quranic sequence of events, where first, you know, the devil is uh, cast out of heaven because of Adam and then seeks to have revenge on Adam in the garden, like it just kind of works and it's kind of sort of satisfying in a way. Um, whereas, you know, in the Bible, uh, you know, obviously the text, uh, at least the garden story, um, was written, I don't know, maybe 1600 years or 1500 years earlier. So like it's whole yeah. other world, or maybe that's not the right number. But anyway, centuries earlier, like you just have lots of ambiguity. And to me, yeah. that's kind of, I don't know if you agree with this, but it seems to me sort of paradigmatic or something else of a larger kind of thing, which is um, in Islamic intellectual tradition, there is kind of an emphasis on certainty, clarity, one thing leads to another, uh, everything kind of works. And in Jewish, not only scholarship, but I think maybe spirituality, there's kind of just more comfort with ambiguity. Yeah. You know, let's talk about this. You think A, I think B, the other guy yeah. B. 
I don't think it's, it's even that? comfort. I think it's like relishing in the ambiguity. Okay. And um, I think that it's seen as a value that I don't know that that is true of Islamic intellectual um, wrestling in the same way, right? That this this idea that it op- that it opens up a door for the conversation. And I think this is actually, I mean, it's slightly off topic, but I think this is actually a very important distinction between Islam and Judaism in the way that they each deal with their their texts, which is that the re- actually dates back to my other project, but the rabbinic understanding of the rabbinic project is that God purposely makes things ambiguous in the text to invite us into the conversation. Okay. And so so the, so the not really like a fault or a defect, like no, it's like, on purpose, right? It's like as if you know, when you're teaching a class, you would do, I'm sure you would do this also, you put a text up on the board and then you'd say like, what do you see here? Let's talk about it. And that's sort of what God is doing, like putting something up and saying like, I'm inviting you in to have this conversation with me and with each other and this wrestling and let's learn sort of the the polyvalency, I guess, of the text is part of the important. And that idea that God is inviting us in, in partnership is sort of blasphemous for Islam. What do you mean that we are partners with God, right? That it's not, that's not an acceptable way to talk about God in Islam, that humans are partners with God. Right. Whereas in in Judaism, that's really the rabbinic yeah. way of, of, seeing, of yeah. seeing the text. So the fact that it's ambiguous, I don't know that there's, again, I, I, I would say more that there's a relishing of the ambiguity more than there's a comfortable with it, right? That's like, that's part of the job of being a Jew is to, is to read the text and figure it out. Right. And if, right. if it came like on a platter, here's what it means. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, Excuse me. Yeah. What's left, what's left for you? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, it's just, yeah, it's an important point that actually has larger lessons for us about how different, uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity are in kind of like the experience of, you know, people in in those traditions. And, you know, there's so much kind of like mushy, I don't know, generalization, and it's been amplified by this notion of Abrahamic religions, plus just like, at least in the U.S., definitely at Notre Dame, but I think generally in the U.S., like this kind of like what you're supposed to say is we're all basically the same and, you know. Um, can I yeah. read a bit from the Quran now? Turn to the Quran. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, yeah. And then just, first of all, I'll, I'll ask you, I'm just going to read a bit from Quran 7 about the garden story. And then, you know, if you could just comment on like what you see here, you know, as someone who knows the Quran and the Bible well, um, what's going on in the Quran? What do you see as kind of like, I don't know, like purposeful or strategic differences from uh, the Genesis story. So this is Quran Al-Araf, Quran 7, starting in verse 20. Um, I'll just read the English here. But Satan whispered to them Mm -hmm. to expose to them their nakedness. Uh, It's the dual there, the them is dual, uh, which was invisible to them. He said, your Lord only prohibited you from this tree so that you do not become angels or become immortals. Next verse, and he swore to them, I am a sincere advisor to you. Next verse, so he lured them with deception, and when they tasted the tree, their nakedness became evident to them, and they began covering themselves with the leaves of the garden. And their Lord called out to them, did I not prohibit you from this tree and say to you that Satan is a sworn enemy to you? Next verse, they said, our Lord, we have sinned against ourselves. Unless you forgive us and have mercy on us, we will be of the losers. So what do I see in there? Um, so I, I see pieces that that um, are similar to what's in the Bible, and I see pieces that aren't similar to what's in the Bible. And so, you know, some of it echoes. I can you know, hear echoes, and then some of it are not echoing the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Um, this idea about Satan whispering, um, uh, I think there are two two of my favorite words in Arabic are chicken and whisper. I don't know why, but this this word waswasa, which is such a great onomatopoeia here, right? That it's it's what it sounds like when you're whispering. Um, 
is not at all. First of all, Satan is not in the Bible. It's it's that comes in from some other place. Um, and he's not whispering in the Hebrew Bible. He's having an actual out conversation. There's no hiding what's going on here in so the Hebrew that, Bible. I mean, do you see the Quran then as having in mind not like the the action in the garden itself, but rather you know, like watch out, uh, Muslim uh, reader or listener. Um, this is Satan might be whispering to you right now. I Jim think it's it's a different depiction of what Satan's job is okay. that that we get in the Quran and that we get in the Hebrew Bible, and that mm -hmm. this feels to me more like the Christian understanding of what Satan's mm -hmm. job is, mm -hmm. how he's portrayed. Mm -hmm. uh, that that he's like this seductive. Um, force i don't know what, what uh, whether yeah. we're to use it, that, enemy, that enemy of humans enemy of humans and a seductive force and trying to lead you into and and like the yeah. whispering in someone's ear is very seductive like it, it creates an intimacy between the two people between the listener and the whisperer you have to lean close you have to listen it's a secret yeah. that just i'm telling you and it, it creates this intimacy between the two characters where which is what satan is getting at here right that that yeah. there's He's trying to pull them yeah. after him yeah. and away from God. Yeah, the um, last verse, the last uh, surah of, of the Quran speaks of He whispers right. into, into the breasts into, of humans. Right, yeah. into the right. The, so I think that that's it's a different and, and also I don't think it's by accident that we have here that he's whispering something that was hidden from them. So it's like a whole the the whole um, not uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, Gabriel? Like not the whole shadiness of the story. I, nice, it, the nice. word right is 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 not um is is there right? They don't know something. He's whispering to keep it a secret. Mm -hmm. Everything, but and yet God knows, despite the whispering and the hidden and the everything that's not manifest to people. God is still going. God still understands what's going on there, and God still sees where. In the Hebrew Bible, we don't have any of that. We have this conversation that's an out and out conversation between them. And also we don't have Satan. And when we do have Satan in the Hebrew Bible, he's not an enemy of humanity. He's actually God's like it says here, uh well, I don't know what the what the the English word that you had in verse 21, mm -hmm. where Satan says, I'm your sincere advisor. Mm -hmm. What was the English that you had there? Yeah, sincere advisor. Yeah. Yeah. So in the Hebrew Bible, it's almost like Satan is God's advisor, I guess you, you could say. And the the best story, just to bring in another complication, is the story of Job, where <laughs> this this feels to me a little bit like there's some sort of Job in here, where he's leading. Sorry, I'm gonna say that again. S Satan in the in the story of Job is is understood to be like a a prosecuting attorney. Mm -hmm. And he's prosecuting, he's prosecuting people, not an enemy to people. So he comes to God in the story of Job in the Hebrew Bible, which is different. What's in the Quran. The Quran is very small. Like mm -hmm. I think it's mentioned twice in the Quran and Are it's you, very, very, yeah. very, yeah, exactly. yeah. It's very limited in its information. But the story of Job in the Hebrew Bible is that, you know, God is walking around, walking around and uh, he says, oh, look, there's my guy, Job. He's stupendously righteous. And Satan comes in and says he's only righteous because he has everything magnificent in the world has ever happened to him. If he starts to suffer, you'll see that he'll curse you. And God says, you're on. And Satan starts to sort of like poke, which is what the Hebrew word really means, right? Um, to challenge and to, and to poke at Job, to try to make him, to show God that Job is not really righteous. And Satan loses that bet because Job ultimately doesn't curse God. Um, He's not this type of seducer whisperer mm -hmm. in the Hebrew Bible. That we get really more and develop, develops out of Christianity, this idea about Satan as this seducer whisperer. Mm -hmm. And we see it also here in the Quran, this seducer whisperer. But we don't see that not in the Hebrew Bible story of Adam and Eve and not in the Hebrew Bible story of anything. This, In fact, we see this satanlo in, in the Hebrew Bible, as we see it as a verb to Satan somebody. Which mm. generally means to to like to get in their way and try to prevent them from doing something to to uh, not challenge is the other word I'm 
I'm trying to think of. Yeah. But to, uh, be an obstacle, be a road. Yeah, be an obstacle. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the, there's also clothing, like nakedness in clothing. It's not really nakedness in the Arabic, actually. No. Um, obviously, in Genesis 2 and 3, uh, it's a thing. And I think uh, the rabbis, you know, have different kind of options that they explore about how to understand. I mean, there's different sequences of things. You know, what were they initially like, Adam and Eve, in terms of clothing and bodies? And what happened next once they ate from the tree? But, I mean, the Arabic, just to maybe... Uh, start us off in terms of thinking through the contrast in the, the first verse I read. Um, so in English, we had um, to expose to them their nakedness, which was invisible to them. Um, you know, the uh, the Arabic speaks of so at the not nakedness, literally, but I mean, it comes from the word that means evil or bad, which is right. interesting. Shameful so parts. some translations, I think, have their forbidden parts or something like that. Uh, but there is this, in, you know, it's subjunctive. In um, it, like it, it, Satan did this whispering, and then the only purpose that's at least explicitly stated is to expose to them, uh, basically, you know, so at the to expose to them their um, forbidden parts or their evil parts. Uh, so, I mean, what do you think of that? Um, later on, actually, after the passage, I didn't read it, but I think it's verses. 24, 25, 26, God gives them kind of uh, new clothing. I think I, I could look it up, but I think God, you know, sends down. There's a problem because there's a word that literally means feathers, but sends down clothing, libas, I think, in Arabic to them. So, uh, I mean, how can knowledge of Genesis help us understand what's going on with the Quranic rhetoric on nakedness and clothing? So this, that he he wanted to show them their shameful parts mm -hmm. really reminds me of of Augustine and okay. what he says about this in original okay. sin. And okay. I don't know if people are going to early fifth century, late fourth, fifth century, yeah. uh, Christian, 40 to 40 kind of the master yeah. of the Latin language tradition of early patristic theology. Yeah. Yeah. That he, and really the, the, um, to use, no, to, not to have a better words, he's sort of like the author of the doctrine of original sin really is as Augustine. And this idea that August, Augustine, correctly asks you know looks at the hebrew bible and says like what do you mean that their nakedness was revealed to them in the hebrew bible that that mm -hmm. didn't they know, like if, let me just go back to the exact phrasing what it says here in the hebrew bible it says um right verse 7 genesis 3 verse 7 then their eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were a rumim there's that nakedness and they sewed for themselves fig That's leaves the same, and the same root of the craftiness that word yeah the crafty snake mm -hmm. yeah uh, then the hashaya rome and then here it's a de rumim mm -hmm. so what does it mean that they their eyes were open augustine asks right and that they know that they were they were naked like how do you not know that you're naked which of course okay. begs the question why would they think that i always ask this to my students right like why would they think that they were naked nothing's wearing clothes so why all of a sudden are they looking mm -hmm. down and saying oh my god i'm naked right it's not like ducks are wearing pants and anything why all of a sudden do they think that they need to be clothed and the other thing is that this is a married couple who doesn't actually need to be clothed around each other so mm -hmm. married i mean this is their their a, a, this couple yeah it was you know not a civil marriage it was right. some other kind of marriage yeah right so so why why is suddenly they're like oh i'm naked and i can't be seen i can't be walking around naked all the time and so, you know, Augustine has this whole thing um, where he says it's not that they, I mean, there's more than one way to, there's, there's some sources that say like they actually couldn't see their naked, their genitalia before then. And then like this mm -hmm. veil was removed from their eyes and they, and they could see it or their veil was removed from somewhere else. Um, but Augustine also says that they, it's not that they knew that they were naked. It's that they suddenly lost control of their um sexual arousal that that sexual arousal used to be like anything else in your body that's not um like the internal things that if i want my arm to move to the right my brain mm -hmm. sends a mm -hmm. message i'm not talking about like your heart beating which you can't control yeah. and now it becomes sort of like your heart beating you can't control it it's yeah. something that happens outside of your control so this um this this quran thing the, the hidden from them of their shame and talking I mean, about in, in the Bible, just to be clear about 
excuse me, in contrast to you in verse 20, in the Bible, uh, this is not what, it's never stated that um, the serpent wanted them to be naked, right? Whereas in the no. Quran, explicitly the Quran declares that that's what Satan was up to. He wanted right. to show them their nakedness. Right. Or show them their genitalia. Yeah, or better, yeah, so at the himal. Yeah. Right. And and then there's also, it's called, why does he want to show them their genitalia? Which, you know, first of all, makes me think of that story where the Midrashic story where Satan wants to sleep with with Eve, right? That that sort of thing. And the connection between crafty and nakedness in the Hebrew, right? That there's something going on with that connection, which we don't see in the Arabic. The Arabic doesn't. So you can all, I mean, all. just to be historical, critical about this, I mean, you can kind of see, obviously, the Quran has a particular agenda, theological teaching, but you can kind of see how the rabbis and presumably the early Christian thinkers are, are sorting through some of the ambiguity and the Quran is engaging not directly with Genesis 2 and 3, but with the whole sort of stream of yeah. conversations about, about Genesis 2 and 3. Yeah. I, I mean, to say that this is sort of the Genesis story is like a little um, dulling of the differences, right? Like what you were saying, that people say like, oh, Jews, Christians, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, it's all the same. No, that's, you know, you've taken a nail file and you've like dulled all the edges and the edges are the are the key. To what makes each a different, yeah, right? What right. makes them yeah. different systems? Mm -hmm. um, so here, I think like it does seem to be. I like that verb, like that it's engaging with the whole tradition here, um, and has this idea about like why does he want to show them their nakedness? I mean, we need to ask, ask that from the Quran also. Like, do they not know that they're naked? And what's the connection between him saying like God forbade you from this tree? lest you should become angels or immortals. Why is that connected to nakedness Yes. in the Quran? So, it's like a so non sequitur. In, 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 sorry for this persistent cough. In Quran 722, God calls out or rather reprimands both Adam and Eve, and at least the sequence of the Arabic and, you know, the exegesis might do something else. But immediately after, Adam and Eve cover themselves with leaves. It's, you know, so, I mean, may just kind of be one thing after another, but there could be some connection there. And I mean, in Genesis, uh, I mean, what does God say to them? Why are you hiding or something? Why are you hiding? Where are you? What? Yeah, first he says, um, he says, why are you hiding? Basically, he says, yeah. where are you? And then God, Adam answers and says, I heard you. Yeah. I heard your voice or your sound. And I, the, hid I was because... afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, God says, who told you that you were naked? Which is actually a really great, what do you mean you're naked? Who told you that, that you were naked and that that's bad? Yeah. And in both cases, I mean, I, I'm not just kind of, you know, doubling down on this point because, I don't know, it's edgy and people like to talk about nakedness and sex and stuff. But like in both cases, it seems to be a thing. Like there's some yeah. concern about nakedness. And Yeah. It seems, what's interesting is that it's, God's question here, who told you that you were naked? It it doesn't seem like it's bad that he knows that he's naked. It's just, what do you, it's such a strange question. Who told you that you were naked? Right. Like, I feel like the question that I might ask if I were in that position, if somebody said I hid from you because I was naked, might be the, why is naked a bad thing? What do you mean naked? Yeah. Everything's naked. Not who told you that you were naked. Yeah. Right. So there, there's something interesting going on there. And the, and I think in the Quran, as you, you were saying before, like it's a little clearer that this is what Satan's goal was the whole mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. was to do this. Of course, why is this Satan's goal? Why is this the goal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he wants revenge. He wants revenge, clearly. But why is he carrying out this revenge by making them aware of their nakedness? Right. Uh, yeah. And then the Quran has this, you know, uh, kind of transitions to a lesson, you know, in verse uh, 26, uh, you know, the divine voice of the Quran addresses all, um, all humans, you know, oh, children of Adam. So we're not, we're kind of outside of the, um, the setting of the garden now. Quran is kind of zoomed back or however you put it and is now just addressing all of humanity and kind of, uh, you know, transitions to this lesson. We have certainly sent down to you libas, garments or clothing uh, to cover um, your uh, your nakedness. 
um, and for adornments, I mean, that's the word that's actually feathers, but usually translates something like adornment. And then there's this kind of spiritual lesson, which is, but the garment or the clothing of taqwa, uh, God wariness, um, that's the best. So yeah. you just get a, a feel <coughs> for the Quranic flavor of like, just, you know, always returning to the spiritual, theological, ethical, legal uh, lesson. Um, the story kind of is second, is not as important. That can be cast aside. What you, and the Quran kind of rushes to uh, the lesson, the moral of the story. Um, anyway, I don't know if you have yeah. more thoughts on that. I mean, the what's, yeah. What's interesting in both cases, right, is that they, they both clothe themselves and then God gives them other clothing. Yeah, right. So uh, is it 321 in Genesis? Uh, God yeah. gives them. I mean, uh, I'm actually looking at a different translation now, the New Jerusalem translation. My translation has tunics of skins. Could, could you explain that? Like, why is God and he seems to do yeah. it himself? Uh, yeah, it's I don't I find it really fast. It looks like leather, right? God makes them leather. And my, 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 my instinct is always to say, like, God made them leather pants. I don't know. Like, um, is the Hebrew something, something like katinot? Kotnot or. Kotnot, kotnot or. Yeah, and kot, and ktonet is the same word that's used for uh, Joseph, for the coat of many colors that Joseph has that leads to problems uh, later on because his brothers are then jealous that, that Jacob makes for him this, this, it's we all often say in Dakota many colors in English, but it's uh, stripes in in Hebrew. It's okay. uh, right, it's on the pasim. Okay. So it's like a a striped garment. I am um, from the movie. Yeah, from the play. I did. I made it. <laughs> yeah. Up, yeah, whatever. Okay. Yeah, Joseph and his amazing technical yeah. dream coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because the song is coat of many colors, but it's a uh, pasim, which are like. Okay. Um. So. It's the same word here as there, which um, if you sort of if, to zoom back and look at the biblical stories, is is there something inherently, I, I don't mean to say it this way, it's going to sound crazy. Is there something inherently bad about us being clothed, that that clothing leads to problems because people then get jealous of each other's clothing and and it's a marker of hierarchy with clothing and, you know, and it looks like God's original intent maybe for us not to have that hierarchical marker but then on the other hand god does give them they made themselves leaves so why do they make themselves they make themselves leaf clothing and he makes them skin clothing, skin clothing which sounds like left i mean to me it just sounds like leather or does it mean that they didn't have skin before that they were they looked like which goes back to this feather thing right that in the quran like there are midrashic texts that that say like that adam was covered with something else first mm -hmm. that wasn't skin and I, I get confused a little bit between between the midrash and the islamic texts because they sometimes bleed into each other in my mind mm -hmm. um but there's there's i think one that says that adam was created i'd have to look it up out of like he was covered in um uh nails like your nails. Yes. What? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely there in the Syriac Christian. I think it's in I, I maybe Ephraim on Paradise or something. Yeah. yeah. The, the the material of fingernails that was his skin. Right. And then he gets this. Right. It gets changed into mm -hmm. into skin. Painful. Well, at least for Ephraim, I think it's painful when it's sort of stretched over his body, the skin that you know we now have. And yeah. So um, so, but is this bit where God is kind of personally making? Uh, clothing out of skins uh, for humans. Is this meant to be like, a, I don't know, a signal that God is sort of um, at least continues to have providential care for Adam and Eve, or maybe has forgiven them? And he's sort of like, you know, how your, um, you know, when your your kid goes back to college, you, you know, uh, mom or dad will make like a goodie bag, like, oh, here's some food for you for your journey, you know, for God in this story, it's making skins, like it's going to be rough out there. Here's some nice clothing, like it, uh, how do the rabbis take it? And how do you read it? Like, is it a sign that God has forgiven them and still loves them? And I don't know that forgiveness is the word that would be used okay. here because it's actually before the punishments. And yeah, um, right, right. 
It comes before the punishments and before the very important thing that God says in the next verse, if we're reading it sequentially, mm -hmm. which is that um, this is bad, that he's eaten and he's going to become like God, which is a whole other, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, and then has to, you know, sends them out of, banishes them from Eden. Oh, actually, is it before or after the punishments? The skin. Well, the, the the sort of listing of punishments oh, yeah. know, for the snake, the woman, and the man comes right before. But then right. like, the banishing. The banishing. In, in a sense, is the ultimate punishment comes after. Right. And it's not just banishing. It's actually like a really um, sort of intense visual that you get that they, that God says he like banishes them from the Garden of Eden and to work the land from which he, they were taken. Right, to work the earth from which they were taken. So this whole like life of luxury is now over. Mm -hmm. And then it says it again in verse 24, Genesis 4, 24, uh, Genesis 3, 24, that, that he, um, the word is Vayigaresh, which is like to chase out. And the first one in, in 23, it's Vayishalchehu, which is to send away, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily, you would send a messenger. Like that's the same verb for that you would send a messenger or a message. But then in verse 24, it's to chase away. It's like to yeah, like it's super intense. Yeah. And he stations a cherub with a fiery sword. Yeah. Should anybody try to get back in, yeah. there's so no this is way. Not like a, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, parent uh, children a loving yeah. relationship. No, this is like threat. you um, are a threat and there's precautions taken to neutralize that. Or... Yeah, you cannot come back. Like there's a divine blockage for ever coming back. So, um, so for, I mean, I think forgiveness. Um, you know, it's a tricky, it's a tricky word to, to use here for this, for this, because they don't ask for forgiveness mm -hmm. and, and they don't, they don't even apologize. None of them, neither of them apologizes, right? Adam says the woman that you gave to me, she gave me an I ate and the rabbinic sources are very unhappy with that. You know, that this sort of passing the buck and not confessing and not taking any responsibility. Mm -hmm. And also the way that when you ask the original question, is Eve bad? Here God gave them, God gave him this amazing gift. And all he could say about it was the woman that you gave me, she gave, right? Like that thing, it's your fault. Okay. So that this might be a nice moment to bring in the name of the woman. So yeah. uh, there, uh what's do you know what the Hebrew is there? When he's kind of uh, you know, um throwing shade on the woman uh does he call her eve there or does no he, call her he says woman? the woman yeah um where is it so um yeah i mean I says, verse 12 the man replied it was a woman you put with me she gave yeah. me some fruit from the tree right it says um uh oops sorry The woman that you that you get it's not even gave to me, it's gave with me, right? That so like you put next to me at my side. Mm -hmm. Um, which also goes back to why is she like how are we to understand the power differential between them? Adam here says it's sort of more of a partnership, the woman that you gave with me, mm -hmm. she gave me and I ate. Mm -hmm. And then God doesn't actually even engage that, right? I, I, I often in my head it sort of feels like God's so disappointed he can't even come back with a with a second <laughs> rejoinder like and he turns immediately to Eve Eve and he said what did you do and she says um, the serpent like duped me and I ate so what's interesting is that Adam sort of tries to blame her but he doesn't say and this is, I think is super important we always think of the story as telling us that Eve seduced him there's no evidence in the biblical story that she seduced him. That the story has him standing basically next to her when the whole thing goes down, right? That 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 when she takes a bite of the of the fruit, it says she gave it to him, who was standing there, and he ate it. There's no she. I always think of like an apple, and you hand it to the next person. Yeah. There's no seduction here, and he doesn't he doesn't say that she seduced me. He just says she gave it to me, and I ate. She says the snake led me like the snake sort of seduced me mm -hmm. um and then god then doesn't even ask the snake a question he automatically like he doesn't even seem to care why the snake is doing what he does he starts automatically with the cursing of the snake um let's say the snake at least in my translation tempted me 
Uh, that's what the woman says. Yeah. Uh, so that, I mean, if the translation reflects at all the Hebrew, I mean, that's bad, right? Tempting is bad, usually. Yeah. So. The God that never says to the snake, what are you doing? Why'd you do this? Yeah. Right? Which yeah. the Quran, he doesn't really ask Satan uh, why he I mean, they it. do have conversation. I don't know if it's in Quran 7, but there's a couple places where... Right, there's a know, couple conversations. He says, well, something like that in the regime so you are a regime whatever that is accursed or something sometimes stoned but it doesn't mean stone uh and then this you know this sorry satan speaks back and is like listen give me give me time to go and tempt uh the man right. uh, or humans and god is like okay uh you have a respite so you can go off and do that yeah i just want to in, in terms of the woman in oh, about the name the name yeah. you would... so she it's only i think in Genesis 3.20, that we hear that the woman, which I think in Hebrew is Isha or something like that, yeah. that she she's named Eve. I mean, Genesis 3.20 says the man names his wife Eve. And the, Hebrew, the human. I down here, someone, Hawa, how do you say it? Hava. Hava, okay. Yeah, so which has something to do with the common Semitic root that uh, we find also in Arabic and actually for the name of Eve in Arabic, um, which is something to do with life, right? Um, yeah, it's so, it's not the man, it's the human, first of all, the, the human named his wife, or his woman, his wife, Chava, yeah. because she was Aim Kol Chai, the mother of everything that lives. Um, uh, but that's before, <laughs> but is she? I mean, if yeah, you read this- The animals are first, they're living. And yeah. Was, yeah, and she's <laughs> not pregnant yet. Very good point. <laughs> right. So and this is also what an interesting thing that happens here, which is that if you look right, she's he names her. First of all, no one names him. He doesn't get a name. So it's part of the sounds like it's hearkening back to God brought everything to see if if Adam would recognize it. Um, And he names her this mother of all living things, which she's not because. Animals don't come from her, but also it's in the next chapter that we find after they're already banished that Adam and his wife know each other and she becomes pregnant. So it's an interesting placement of the story. And this leads to, you didn't ask this question, but I'm just going to say it anyway, this rabbinic understanding. Sorry, let me take a step back. It, 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 there's an association in Christianity between the sin and sex, Right, that that becomes that becomes associated to with each other, which mm -hmm. harkens back to Augustine, right, who makes this association between sexual arousal and the sin, and and therefore this is why it sort of sticks to all of us that that um it, that the sexual knowledge comes after, sorry, the sexual uh, interactions between Adam and Eve come after the sin. So mm -hmm. there's something that happens in Christian theology where where sex itself becomes sort of fruit of the forbidden tree mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right sex and so therefore that's why you get this early <clears throat> these early attempts in christianity to sort of like limit sexual intercourse between married couples to only the only thing that purifies it is if you're gonna have children right this obviously not what happens in the modern church but sort of uh, um yeah i don't i don't know i just don't know enough about that but yeah yeah well like sex is not you're not supposed to this is why you're not supposed to use contraception because if it's not going to lead to procreation then it's not a it's not a permitted um yeah a hundred percent in yeah. uh humanae vitae and you know uh, sort of magisterial teaching now i just don't know the early church i don't know the attitude anyway doesn't matter yeah that's so that's the earlier nowadays they don't say that right there's a there's another value for sexual interaction with couples but but um but here we have what the rabbis end up doing, which is so interesting, is if you look at chapter four, verse one, you can see this in the Hebrew and not in the English, is that the verb that's used here for Adam and his Adam knowing his wife mm -hmm. is is in the past tense, mm -hmm. um, Adam yada, which is that he knew. Um, but in biblical Hebrew, the I don't know how to say this super clearly in biblical hebrew the past tense is almost always written with the future tense and this vav meaning and stuck onto it and that vav knocks the future tense into the past tense so when you have an actual past tense it means um what do you call that in english grammar it's past that's already complete yeah not, that's like not past perfect or something yeah something like so like I not know. i was i it's like 
it's not I had been eating when this happened, yeah. but I had finished eating when this happened. Yep. Right. So if you see here, it says the man knew in the past tense, it's that the man had known his wife. So, yeah. So the rabbis say she was pregnant when they were banished. Yeah. And that the reason that he's calling her the mother of all living things is she's already pregnant. Yes. And that okay. they had been yeah. they'd been having sex before in the garden. The yeah. In the garden. Yeah. And that sex and the sin are not connected. Right. Where Augustine makes this connection. Um, the rabbinic sources don't make that connection yeah. between them. And also, if you look at the first creation story. In the first creation story, the whole reason. Right. What is it that that first commandment that God uh, gives them is not don't eat from the tree. But the first commandment is let me just find it. About dominion in the garden, that kind of stuff there. Uh, be yeah. fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Exactly. Yeah. Here, let, let us make humankind in our image. They shall rule the fish of the sea. And he creates them, creates them male and female. And the very first direct command he gives to Adam and Eve is not dominion, but yeah. be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. That's the commandment. Yeah, which you, you need sex to do. Which you need sex to do. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so. Uh, yeah. There's this different thing that's going on there. And so, you know, when we look at the Quran story and the nakedness is part of a satanic thing, it's like a different, it's coming from a different like window than the rabbis are looking through when the rabbis look at. Yes. Yes. Um, I want to ask uh, two, two more questions. Uh, uh, and then you're so patient with me. Thanks for still being. Oh, thank you. Um, one is, you know, a little bit out of left field. It's not directly connected, but um, uh, <laughs> as I was um, reading some stuff in advance of our chat on this, I looked at some hadith, and uh, there's uh, one here which is a bit, I don't know, curious. Um, uh, so it, it's from Bukhari, and you know, in terms of like a snad criticism or whatever, people seem to say, you know, that you know, Sahih. Uh, there are different versions of it. Now, some people say, yeah, but it's narrated by Abu Huraira, and some people think you can just eliminate anything Abu Huraira reported, but whatever, that doesn't really matter uh, what is not criticism leads to here. But the Hadith says, um, the Prophet said, quote, were it not for Beni Israel, were it not for the Israelites, a meat, um, uh, so uh, laham, meat would not decay um, and were it not for Eve, no woman would ever betray her husband. Um, so that, that's intriguing because it kind of signals something, yeah, not original sin leading to atonement and things, but just like there are implications for Eve's actions. Uh, I mean, is, in the Quran, it's kind of weird because Eve doesn't right. do anything independent. Nothing. They always right. act together. So yeah. um, it's not, whereas their actions are disambiguated or something, they're independent in Genesis. So, I mean, in I guess it's kind of combining both questions. We could just do both at once. I mean, definitely in the Hadith, there's some negative stuff about Eve uh, yeah. and a way of sort of signaling women generally disobedience of women, like women generally are a problem, yeah. uh, you know, especially, you know, disobedient women. Um, so what about in, uh, you feel free to comment on the Hadith as well, uh, the decaying meat, we could speak about that separately some other time maybe, but like, how does this work out in Judaism? I mean, I'm even interested in like, you know, uh, medieval, modern, contemporary discourse, obviously lots of different positions. <laughs> like, I mean, to return to where we began, you know, when Jewish um, uh, scholars or, you know, Jews generally think about Eve, like what is kind of the vibe there? So I, I mean, I find that hadith is super interesting because it does seem it doesn't match what's in the Quran, right? That right. there's right. clearly Bukhari and the hadith are talking with some other knowledge, right? That it's mm -hmm. and we get this whole if you look in at like allusion to meat decaying signals biblical knowledge of prob probably manna and quails in Exodus. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Right. Also that and and you know um uh yeah, I mean I, I, when you look at like Thalabi and, and all of them, not just I mean whatever, so we, we don't 
say that he's a from Qisas tradition or not, but still, like, there's all of this in Ibn Kathir that that when you look at the the exegetical read of the Quranic story, it starts to sound much more like the biblical slash midrashic mm-hmm. information. It sort of like rereads the Quran mm-hmm. through the lens of not the Quran, um, which is fascinating because the I think the Quran does a very impressive job of not blaming one of them over the other and it's a much more unified front um and from a from a feminist perspective like i'd rather that that the that you know like or from a female perspective that i'd rather not have her as the ancestress be dinged for in sorry i'll take a step back what happens in the story is that adam sort of is cleansed of the story she seduces him but that's not what's in the but the biblical text and the quran does a much better job of keeping that out of the story that she seduces him, which is not in the Hebrew Bible. Mm-hmm. And then in the Hadith, they put it back in, which is like disappointing that they put it back in. Um, but what happens in the um, in the, some of the Gemara texts, some of the Talmudic texts, some of the rabbinic texts, is that they do blame her for, they, I said this earlier, they say things like, um, there are specific commandments that are given to women because of Eve's sin. Mm-hmm. So this idea that because she did something, women have specific commandments. And there's also 10 hardships that women are said to suffer because of Eve's sin. And one of them is menstruation and the other is um, bleeding at the first night of intercourse or sort of like a virginal breaking of the hymen sort of situation. That there are things that that without her having done that, there would have been none of this in the world Mm -hmm. is what it says. and so. There's like a, a parallel sort of with it's not women wouldn't betray their husbands, but um, which is fascinating that it's phrased that way and not that they wouldn't violate God's mm-hmm. commandment, that it's mm-hmm. betraying their husbands is sort of a, a fascinating thing. Um, in in the Jerusalem Talmud, there's a there's a text that says that Eve's sin brought menstruation into the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, the word I mean, just on the betray. Sorry. I, I don't want to forget that we go back to yeah. the uh, the latter point, but just the the word rendered as betrayed uh, is from the root achan or achanat in the feminine. It is ambiguous, but it can imply like cuckolding him, you know, actually betraying yeah. him through. I uh, so I don't know where that, how that connects to Bible or Quran, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think if I'm not incorrect, I. Th- think that that's the same word that um, the wife of Loth yes. and the wife of Noah totally. yeah. are totally accused of, right? Yes. It's the same, yeah. it's the same word there, um, which is also interesting. Uh, what type of betrayal are they doing? Is it sexual betrayal of their husbands or is it religious betrayal of their husbands? And um, yeah, so, so there, there is this rabbinic blaming of her for things as well and this idea that what she did also is like still sticks to us Mm -hmm. in humanity of women for now and had she not sinned then menstruation wouldn't have existed in the world so what's the problem with menstruation right why is that oh without eve first of all it's not in the text of the bible at all Mm -hmm. so i think i think clearly there's like some patriarchal tradition that gets Mm-hmm. Uh, infiltrating these rabbinic texts, right? Looking at yeah. women's bodies through sort of a patriarchal lens. And what's the problem with menstruation is really that it knocks a woman into ritual impurity. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's a temporary ritual impurity. So I don't know why the rabbis are so upset about it. Like it knocks women into a temporary ritual impurity. And during that ritual impurity stance, there are certain things that you can and cannot do. Um, one of which is have sex with your husband. To go back to the Hana thing, right? Like that this... this um, betrayal is maybe sexual betrayal so there's a whole there there is there is this idea that you know eve is not neutral in a way here in the rabbinic tradition um have there been attempts in i mean we really should wrap up but just like feminist or other sorts of jewish authors more recently of like uh i don't know what the right word is but sort of like uh recapturing the the virtues or the heroism yeah painting yeah painting even heroic colors in one way or another well i think people point out that she doesn't actually seduce him and that all of this like 
all of this t- a tendency to see her in a bad light is really much later with the rabbis okay. who are working yeah. at a point in time yeah. and that the biblical text doesn't say that. Okay. Um, and she doesn't do anything bad the rest of the time, right? That, yeah. that, uh, I mean, the next time we see her, she's giving birth and then that's, that's all. And she names her sons, oh, which is also okay. fascinating well, in, in exactly. Genesis, right? Adam, who's naming everything, she okay. names the sons, mm-hmm. um, or at least Cain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, there's, there is a read of her in which it becomes clear that that there's like the patriarchy has come in here and re and read bad into the into the story. Um, I will say that this is only slightly connected, but you know the the story of Lilith was embraced by feminists by modern fem- Jewish feminists, which is okay. that okay. I don't know how familiar I don't, this is slightly off topic, but that there's a character in jewish tradition called lilith who in the hebrew bible is really just the word for a female demon um but she becomes in the rabbinic tradition personified into a person Mm -hmm. um kind of like a succubus who kind of like sneaks into your house in the middle of the night in a salem witch kind of way um and she um is said to have it's an attempt to uh, to explain why there's two creation stories and so that there's the first creation story in which Adam and Eve are equal is this results in a wife named Lilith and she runs away because, do you know this story? Um, I, not really. My kids talk about it. I don't know why there's something on. She's in the comic books. I don't know. Social media, people make yeah. a big deal about it. I, like, but I don't know it from the real, the real sources. Yeah. So this, I think the earliest written source that we have is the, is a book called Ben Sira and it's from like the eighth to 10th century, which is fairly late. But the, the story is told that Adam and Eve, sorry, Adam and Lilith are created. And again, everything goes back to sex in these stories, but um, that she was refusing to take the subordinate position in sex. And she said to Adam, I would like to be on top, please. And he said, no, you are not worthy of it. You're created to be underneath me. And she said, what are you talking about? We were created exactly the same, both of us from Earth. And he said, no. Nah. And so she said, well, there's no point in arguing with you. I'm out of here. And she like utters God's ineffable name and flies away. Wow. And yeah. By feminist authors yeah. <laughs> so she leaves and Adam comes back to God and complains. The woman that you gave me, she left. And now I have no companion. So God dispatches these three angels and says to these angels, go, go get her tell her to come back but if she doesn't want to come back she doesn't have to except that a hundred of her like demon children have to die every day but and if she wants to come back that's fine so the angels find her and they start threatening her which is not what god said and they start threatening her and saying like if you don't come back we're going to throw you into the raging waters and she says like i don't care and ultimately they tell her what god told her and she says i'm not coming back i'm okay with my hundred of my demon children dying every day and on top of that, I will, I was only created in order to kill human babies. It's clear there's two stories that are being sewn together here in this text, but I was only created in order to um, kill human babies. But if I see the, the names of the three of you on an amulet above the baby's heads, I won't, I won't kill those babies. So then you get these, am- like these birth amulets that happened. So what ends up happening, yeah. yeah, with these three angels' names and, um, or even Lilith, sometimes Lilith's image um, that's supposed to be on there. Um, yeah, and then we see in the rabbinic text that Lilith, I mean, that's sort of the biggest personification, but Lilith is supposed to be this character with long hair and like sneaks up. You shouldn't sleep alone at night because a Lilith will come in and get you um, in the rabbinic materials. But the feminist movement in the 70s named a modern feminist magazine called was called Lilith. And then there's a, why would you name a magazine after a demon? And you would name this magazine after a demon because she won't accept a subordinate position and justifiably so um and she says like there's no point talking to you anymore you're not listening and you're making up you're making up stuff that's not there right it's sort of like the rabbinic equivalent or the the equivalent of saying that eve seduced adam which is not there in the text um and they uh yeah and also god doesn't god kind of like lets her be to a certain extent right he doesn't say like force her to come back 
if she wants to come back, okay. If she doesn't, if she doesn't want to, she doesn't have to, that sort of thing. So that's, th there's that. Like Lilith becomes a little bit more of a, a, a character in, in modern feminist circles. But Eve, like, I think the most feminist rereading of modern feminist of Eve is, is to point out that what the rabbinic sources say is going on in the text is not what the text actually says. It raises, I mean, it's for another time, I guess, but it raises interesting questions about, you know, how you uh, think through religious questions, relationship of tradition, scripture, reason, uh, all these things. Um, I think we should probably wrap it up. Uh, Everyone, so in addition to subscribing to Exploring the Quran and the Bible, uh, liking this video, I mean, thank you for, if you're still watching, <laughs> for being here still. Uh, we will link um, down below uh, in the description uh, Professor Lowen's um, works and continue to update that. And I really hope we can, um, Sherry, uh, have another chat um, at the right time about your ongoing work in regard to what the Quran says that the Jews uh, say, um, I think it's a really important um, topic, not only because, uh, you know, there's still a lot of kind of uh, um, nuts and bolts work to be done there, but obviously it has implications for, you know, dialogue and that kind of thing. So anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you, sir.